what I'd like to do is to take up from where we left off yesterday. Uh, we had ended up looking at the temperature dependence of carrier concentration. And what we saw in that is that if we plot a natural log sigma versus one, not sigma, sorry, the carrier concentration versus one by T, we see a behavior that is something like this. And we had identified three regimes at lower temperatures, it was the ionization range. And then you had an area of saturation, which was also referred to as the extrinsic range. And then you had the intrinsic range. And two temperatures that were identified as TS and TI related to the saturation behavior and the intrinsic behavior, start of saturation and start of intrinsic behavior. So we had a relationship that are related N and uh, T, and then what we did was we looked at various uh, mechanisms that would affect mobility. And it uh, turns out that there are many, but the two that we focused on were phonon scattering or lattice vibration scattering and impurity scattering specifically ionized impurity scattering. And each of these had a different temperature dependence that we saw. One was proportional to T to the power minus 3 by 2 or 1.5. The other had a T to the power plus 1.5 dependence. And so when we plot the mobility versus T, we saw the overall one curved like that, another like that. And the overall behavior approximated by this, according to Matheson's rule. Now you can plot the same thing for convenience, because the next thing we'll do is to combine these ideas and uh, plot it as a function of 1 by t. And as you may guess, that even if you plot it as a function of 1 by t, the shape of the curve remains the same, except that now the, the ionized impurity region becomes on this side and the phonon region, so it just sort of flips around, roughly, if we look at it, right? So I will actually now go ahead and look at conductivity versus temperature. And when we do that, we know our equation sigma is equal to Ne mu E. And now we have the temperature dependence for N, we have the temperature dependence for mu. So we're going to plot sigma versus 1 by T. Or actually, I should give you a couple of thoughts before that. Can we hold this? I'll, I'll, sk I'll come back to this page. Hold that for a second. Yeah. Yes, I didn't show that as yet. That is the thing I wanted to take up in a second. Uh, that I forgot that part. Give me a second. So mobility, we showed that there is a temperature dependence, but there is also a dependence on the ionized impurity concentration. How that affects it? So we'll come back to conductivity in a second. How that affects it is that if you look again at mobility versus temperature and make a plot this time for the same semiconductor but having different amounts of doping. In other words, we're going to play with the ionized impurity scattering also. How much is the concentration? And when we do that, at low concentrations, it's somewhat like this. Say, for silicon, 10 to the power 16 doping. This is the doping concentration. And I'm going to change the concentration and see what happens to the curve. So as we increase the concentration, so just a schematic, nothing. You can begin to see that as the concentration increases, the effect of the ionized impurity scattering is becoming more and more predominant so that the curve is now beginning to shape downwards here. So at very low concentrations of impurities, doping density, if you will, these are sort of doping densities that we plotted as a function of. When the doping density is very low, ionized impurity scattering is not a very important thing here, unless you probably go to very low temperatures. But uh, as we increase the doping concentration, we find that the ionized impurity scattering is beginning to kick in more and more. So this is how we look at both the temperature effect and the effect of ionized impurities. 
And I pointed out that the ionized impurity itself, the concentration has got a temperature dependence. But as long as we are talking about the saturation regime, where all of them have become ionized, then the temperature dependence of the ionization is no longer there. They've all been ionized. But if you're talking in the ionization range, there is the additional temperature dependence coming from the uh, ionization process. OK? So what people have done is also gone and plotted, particularly for silicon, there are now some very standard curves where they've plotted mu, the mobility, versus carrier concentration, dopant concentration. Okay, And we can plot for, the arguments are roughly the same for the hole and electron, so we can plot for both, and it will look something like this. That's mobility versus carrier concentration for the electrons. And for holes, not the exact shape of the curve, but just a schematic. So something like 10 to the power 15 till 10 to the power 20, if we plot. <coughs> and we know the electron mobility in silicon at low carry, the highest mobilities are of the order of about 1,500. So say 1,000 is here, 2,000 is somewhere there. And what is the whole mobility for silicon? Around 450. Uh, that's the maximum. So we have around, say, 500 somewhere here and so on. But as we increase the carrier concentration, the mobility is dropping. Beyond some carrier concentration, say 10 to the power 17 or so, it's predominantly influenced by the impurity concentration and not by the uh, lattice scattering. So this is sort of room temperature data. So it's like as if we've taken a cross section at some point in the previous plot, right? If I take, say, in this case, somewhere at this certain temperature, let's call that room temperature, and we're checking how does the mobility value change with carrier concentration for 10 to the power 15 to 10 to the power 20. Now, don't compare the two plots. One, one is an absolute schematic of mine, which has no real relevance, uh, whereas this is roughly the shape of mobility versus carrier concentration in silicon. But this is how it's generated, basically. You know, you got it as a function of temperature uh, for different carrier concentrations. So 10 samples were studied, and then you, at a particular temperature, look to see how it varies. So this is the influence of uh, impurity concentration, the Ni part of that equation, mu proportional to t to the power uh, 1.5 by Ni. OK? Let's come back to the conductivity plot that I started. So here what we're going to do is to plot the log of sigma conductivity versus um, 1 by t. Now what we have to remember is that the mobility curve has got a shape in 1 by t also something like this, where you had plotted it earlier for t. And the carrier concentration curve we had seen has a shape something like this. Okay. So looking at this, since this is the product of these two, the conductivity at the lower temperatures is influenced significantly by the carrier concentration. Okay? So it will follow the shape of the carrier concentration curve. And up here at high temperatures also, it is influenced predominantly because the mobility has gone down low. So it's the carrier concentration that influences it significantly. So even up here, it's got some shape like this. But in the intermediate region, the carrier concentration is flat. It has no temperature dependence. That's the saturation range. And that's where it will follow the temperature dependence of the mobility curve. So it will look something like this. So we've got the curve for sigma for n and for mu, all versus 1 by t. And you can see that uh, most of the region, it follows the shape of the 
carrier concentration except for within the saturation range where it begins to take on the shape of the mobility curve. Now even here you can roughly use this curve to get the slope here is also still related to EG and the slope here is also still related to delta E because they are following the <coughs> curves for carrier concentration primarily. But the more accurate I think the value we can get is out of the curve for carrier concentration. So we've uh, given a picture of how the carrier concentration, I'm sorry, how the resistivity change, uh, conductivity changes versus 1 by T. And we see that conductivity is increasing with temperature. As we go up in temperature, conductivity is increasing. If you had to draw this, say, for a metal, what would it have looked like? Conductivity would decrease with, with increasing temperature because there is no additional generation of carriers, but there is an increase in scattering. In other words, the mobility term is going to dominate there with the number of electrons remaining more or less constant. So we are not generating new electrons into a conduction band. They are available there. But the mobility term is decreasing significantly because of increased scattering. So you will get a decrease in conductivity for a metal. And that's one of the immediate tests that you have if you have a sample and you don't know whether it's a metal, a conductor, or whether it's a semiconductor or insulator, is to measure the conductivity or the resistivity as a function of temperature and look at it. <coughs> Excuse me. We come to uh, an idea, a quick idea in between two topics. I will briefly touch upon this. Degenerate and non-degenerate semiconductors. You see, all along in our description of doping, <coughs> excuse me, we've described that N at best is coming to be ND, though at very low temperatures it is significantly different from ND, that is the carrier concentration is approximately ND in the higher temperature range. But we've made one significant assumption in our discussion that N or ND, whichever it is, is much less than NC. How did that influence our discussion? That N is much less than NC? What were we able to do using this assumption? How did we make use of it? You remember what is NC? Density of states in the effective density of states in the conduction band, right? And so there's a very large number of states available, and this approximation says that I've got few electrons in a large number of states. And so we made use of the Boltzmann approximation, right? We were not going to use the full Fermi Dirac function there. We made the Boltzmann approximation. And then we also saw that, therefore, we can treat the electrons as if they are part of a gas, the 3 by 2 kT and things like that. That is arising because we are treating a situation where we have made the assumption that the doping concentration is much lower than the density of states. In such a case, all those equations that we have derived apply, and the semiconductor is then known as a non-degenerate semiconductor. The same kind of discussions would apply for holes or a p-type, and there the argument would be that p or Na is much lower than Nv, the density of states in the valence band. So as long as either of these conditions apply, that means if you're talking of n-type, that the don donor concentration or of p-type, the acceptor concentration is lower than the respective density of states, then it's a non-degenerate semiconductor. And our arguments so far hold good. But if I go on increasing my doping concentration, namely when ND is greater than NC or at least of the order of that, and conversely when P is greater than NV, then such semiconductors are called degenerate semiconductors. <coughs> 
when we use words like degenerate, it doesn't mean that the semiconductors are morally bad. That's how the word degenerate is normally used in the English language. Eh? He's a degenerate fellow. It's, you know, it's not a reflection of the moral behavior of the semiconductor, but of the electronic behavior. It has degenerated from its semiconductor type behavior and begins to show metallic behavior. Because now the carrier concentration is so high, it is beginning to show a metallic behavior. And rho becomes then proportional to T. Or conversely, sigma is proportional to 1 by T, as we saw. <clears throat> In this case, we cannot use the Boltzmann approximation anymore. And what is happening now is that we have such a high number of donors that they begin to interact with each other. You see, when we started off, we had the idea that we have the doping concentration in parts per million, kind of very low concentrations. And now what we're saying is that we've put in so many that instead of it being like one arsenic atom surrounded by a million silicon atoms, the arsenic atoms are getting fairly close to each other. And now we are having an interaction between the levels and energy states of the arsenic atoms. Just as we had when we brought early on, say, two hydrogen atoms close together or two silicon atoms close together from infinity, we saw those interactions. As long as it was a very dilutely doped semiconductor, that interaction was not significant. But now we're saying it's become to the point where these are going to start interacting with each other. And when we do that, we create an impurity band. <coughs> Again, now we are having a set of closely spaced levels that are approximated by a band. Instead of that single level that we drew for the donor, we have a band created by the impurities, which overlap into the conduction band. It's a fairly narrow band because we're close to conduction band edge. But now we have that there's a band that is overlapping into the conduction band. And what that means is now that my Fermi level, EFN in this case, is located where? Inside the conduction band, right? That is sort of like it was in the case of metals, where the Fermi level is inside a partially filled band, lots of states available, kind of it can go on and so on, right? So Fermi level is in conduction band. Now under these circumstances, if I go on increasing the doping concentration, not all the dopants will get ionized because now these are interacting with each other in certain ways that it ends up that N is no longer equal to ND. Even though the temperature is high enough, not all the donor atoms are getting ionized to create electrons. In fact, at some point, the carrier concentration is going to saturate. And we have at approximately something of the order of 10 to the power 20 per centimeter cube. So beyond this, you, you, you go on putting in within the limits of solid solubility of the dopant, you go on adding, say, arsenic into silicon. But even if you go beyond this point, the carrier concentration is not going to increase beyond that point. Okay? And as can be expected, NP no longer equal to Ni squared. This was one of our fundamental laws that we had got for the intrinsic as well as the extrinsic case but now it is no longer applicable. Incidentally, this law that NP is equal to Ni squared is referred to as the law of mass action. Uh, we'll use it in those terms coming down, but that's how it is called. NP is equal to Ni squared is known as the law of mass action by analogy with chemical reactions. <coughs> well, that's all I'll say about degenerate and non-degenerate semiconductors. And now we'll take up a topic that will lead us to recombination and minority carriers. <coughs>
and the lifetime of minority carriers. These are some things I hope to cover in this, the remaining part of this lecture. Now we know that thermally, electron hole pairs or EHPs, that's another common abbreviation in the literature, electron hole pair. EHPs are being generated thermally all the time. I'm going on exciting electrons out of the valence band into the conduction band. And if the system is in equilibrium, something must be happening to cause these electrons to restore it to its original condition. I can't go on indefinitely creating electron hole pairs and, there, and still maintain equilibrium. So since uh, at any given temperature I'm exciting electrons from the valence band to the conduction band, obviously it's an implication that there must be a mechanism that is removing electrons from the conduction band and recombining them with the holes that have been created in the valence band. Uh, we, do not, we have not discussed that mechanism at large, but we, we, we can be aware just intuitively that there must be such a mechanism in order to maintain the equilibrium one mechanism that is creating the pairs, one that is removing them. And this process of removing them is actually called recombination. Recombination is the process that uh, maintains the balance along with the thermal generation of electron hole pairs. So we look at this a little bit more closely. Uh, one electron that we have, the basic idea behind recombination is that one electron in the conduction band moving around freely in, in some local region you know, it's moving, and in some local region it encounters a hole. And recombines with the hole. What this looks like in terms of bonds, if you remember, we said that the creation of electron hole pairs thermally involve the breaking of bonds, right? If you remember the structure for silicon that we drew, <coughs> excuse me, that the silicon is bonded to all these other things. And we said that on an average, uh, some of these bonds, the vibrations have got enough energy to break a bond. Then one of these bonds then is broken and a free electron starts wandering around. That's how it was created, leaving behind a hole. So we can imagine then that recombination is the process by which a broken bond or an unsatisfied bond gets satisfied. So basically this process means that the electron is moving around, finds a broken bond and fills in there. And in terms of the band picture, it means that it has moved from the conduction band back into the valence band. It is now bound. The electrons in the valence band are bound electrons. So from the conduction band where it was moving freely, it has now come and localized itself by being by filling up this broken bond. Now this recombination could occur in a couple of ways. One we call direct recombination and the other is indirect recombination. In direct recombination typically a photon is released. as the electron moves from the conduction band back into the valence band. And the photon that is released has an energy, H nu, roughly equal to Eg. In the case of the indirect band gap, or indirect recombination, I should say, we haven't yet discussed indirect band gap. In the case of the indirect recombination mechanism, this process of directly going from the conduction band to the valence band is not very efficient. And so some other intermediate methods are required and phonons are involved there. We'll look at each of these a little more in detail. The two things to remember is that when an electron moves from the conduction band to the valence band or whatever it might do, to recombine. First of all, momentum has to be conserved, conserved. And secondly, energy has to be also conserved. 
So in the case of the direct recombination, the energy is being conserved by the emission of the photon. And we know a photon has got low momentum, large energy. Conversely, a phonon has got large momentum, low energy. We had seen that earlier. So uh, this is an important part of understanding why in some cases, in certain semiconductors, it is a direct recombination, and in other semiconductors, it is an indirect recombination, the idea that you have to conserve momentum. Let me briefly take us to the idea of direct band gap, indirect band gap. You should know these, but let's review it very quickly. In direct band gap, what we say is that the minima in the conduction band lies at the same k vector as the maxima in the valence band. Okay. Actually, I think the k should be drawn more like here because our reference is with respect to the valence band energy. The minima in the conduction band corresponds to the maxima in the valence band in terms of the momentum, k space. On the other hand, in the case of indirect band gap materials, we have a scenario that is quite different, and we have it that the k vectors are very different for the minima in the conduction band and the maxima in the valence band. Now, k we know represents what? What is K? Wave number. wave number, wave vector, so on. But we also know that it can represent momentum, right? By this relation, P is equal to H bar K. K represents momentum. So effectively, this diagram is also a energy versus momentum plot. And I just said that in order in these transitions that take place, momentum has to be conserved. Now, the most likely transitions that are going to take place are from the minima to the maxima here. And the same here, from the minima to the maxima here. <coughs> Excuse me. What we see is that there's a fundamental difference between these two mechanisms, between these two types of materials. In this case, when it moves from the minima to the maxima, automatically momentum is conserved because both of them have the same k value. So we don't have to worry about introducing any other methods of conserving momentum. So this transition will involve just coming from top to bottom. The energy excess is released as a photon H nu. And in this case, that is our band gap. If you remember, that's how we define the band gap, e.g., as being equal to the bottom of the conduction band to the top of the valence band. So we have there that e.g. then is equal to H nu. Now, when we come to the indirect band gap materials, we have a problem here. If I want to make this transition, I'm going to have to find a way to change the momentum of the electron to do that. It simply cannot drop down there. And the way it has to do it is by using some third party. It makes use of something else. And typically, phonons help in this process. So it is a phonon-mediated or a phonon-assisted transition from the conduction band to the valence band. Now the problem lies here that the phonon that is required must have a certain momentum. Not any phonon will do because I'm, I'm going to have to cause the momentum shift. Right? Now what is the possibility or the probability that a phonon of the right momentum value just happens to be near where an electron is trying to recombine with a hole. Remember, this is just a local thing. It's, uh, this recombination is going to take place at a certain locality. It can't happen anywhere. And so an electron in this area wants to recombine with this hole, but it needs a phonon of the right magnitude to help it. Either the phonon can have, uh, you know, it could be that a phonon is absorbed or a phonon is produced. Both these possibilities are there. And because of the fact that it involves the probability of involving the right phonon, this process is much more inefficient than the earlier process. So the indirect transitions that take place are much more inefficient 
than the direct recombination. And that's the reason why direct band gap materials are preferred in optoelectronics for applications like LEDs, lasers, and so on. But in addition to this uh, phonon-mediated kind of process, actually the possibilities are there that the, in the indirect material, there could be some other ways in which uh, the transition may take place. And we make use of the idea of recombination centers. This is more likely how the uh, electron is recombining with a hole in the indirect recombinations. What are recombination centers? They could be donor or acceptor impurities. Metallic impurities. Crystal defects. Which involve Things like dislocations, vacancies, interstitials, etc. And how does this work? Basically, a recombination center increases the recombination prob probability by compensating for or taking up, if you want to use the word, compensating for the momentum difference. Between electron and hole. <clears throat> it is able to absorb that difference in momentum, if you want to think of it that way. And the schematically, I'll show you what it looks like. If we have the conduction band and the valence band, a recombination center has got a level somewhere in between there. And there is an electron that is wandering around in the conduction band free. This is a recombination center with energy ER. And when it comes to a recombination center, it is getting trapped in there. It's attracted to it and is held in there. The process is electron capture, okay, by the recombination center. And then what happens is that it is held in there and it uh, maybe a hole is wandering by. or the opposite, the electron is in the vicinity of the hole there. Again, that is labeled as my conduction and VB and so on, the same definitions. And when it is in the vicinity of a hole like this, a suitable hole comes by, then the process of recombination takes place that this trapped electron recombines with the hole. Then now both the electron and the hole are eliminated. In the process, a phonon is released. Now, in some cases, phonons are absorbed and things like that, but the basic idea is phonon is released here. It's involving a center that attracts the electron, holds it there till a suitable phonon comes. I'm sorry, till a suitable hole comes by. Yeah? And these tend to be rather deep states. And in this process, both an electron and a hole or an electron-hole pair are permanently removed. I lay the emphasis on the word permanently to distinguish it from the next case that we will look at. <coughs> so by looking at the rough mechanism, a broad schematic like this, we can say that uh, obviously the crystal structure or the, the uh, nature of defects, the defect distribution in a material is going to influence this recombination process because all these mechanisms that we saw 
are responsible. So even though it's the same semiconductor silicon and you've grown it and I've grown it and somebody else has grown it, the growth mechanisms may be different or how we grew it, that the defect structures may be very different and therefore the recombination behavior could also be rather different in each of these cases. The related phenomenon that I want to talk about is called trapping. It's related in that in trapping also an electron is captured by a trap, local trap. So this is also a localized trap state with an energy ET. And thus it is temporarily removed from the conduction band. So the same wandering electron comes by and is trapped here. The thing is that it is held in this trap for some time. And then if there is enough of a thermal lattice vibration, an energetic lattice vibration that has got enough energy, this gets freed out here to again become a free electron in the conduction band. All right? In the previous case, once the electron got caught into the recombination center, it, was, it couldn't get out. It waited there, it was trapped there till a hole came by. In this case, it is sitting there till there is enough of a energetic vibration to push it out of there back into the conduction band. So what it does is this trapping mechanism is temporarily decreasing or suddenly increasing the carrier concentration in the conduction band. It's a temporary process. It hasn't removed that electron out of the band completely as it did in the case of the recombination center. And the trapping behavior could be the main determining factor in the performance of certain devices. It could be the limiting factor. If there are many such traps, we go on seeing a change in the properties and this could affect the device behavior. Obviously how long it sits in the trap and all that is an important thing. The difference between the trap and the recombination center without going into great detail is that primarily the recombination centers lie much deeper in the band, in the, in the gap, okay? So the recombination centers that we looked at are states that are deeper within the band. Trapping centers tend to be shallower states. That brings us to the topic of majority and minority carriers. And then time permitting, we look briefly at carrier lifetime. Now in semiconductor, I have to deal with both electrons and holes. And I have to have some kind of notation or terminology to describe electrons and hole concentrations inside the semiconductor. And so basically we will treat uh, for an n-type semiconductor, we know that the majority of them are electrons. Uh, right? And so electrons in an n-type semiconductor are known as the majority carriers. <coughs> and holes are known as the minority carriers. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we use the note the converse is true for a p-type, where in that case an electron is a minority carrier and a hole is a majority carrier. So here when we want to talk of concentrations, the notation we use is this. N subscript N refers to the electron concentration in N type. So that would be referred to, say, as the majority carrier concentration. And uh, P subscript N 
is then the holes concentration in the end type or minority carrier concentration. And similarly, then we will have P. P is the majority carrier concentration in a P type, and NP is the minority carrier in a P type. I'm not going to deal much with the P type uh, from now on, but that's the general idea that we get of these. Now, if you're thinking about the semiconductor in equilibrium, in equilibrium and in the dark. I will point out that what we might talk of, are these are what will be used, the notation for the instantaneous value at any given instant, okay? Particularly in equilibrium and in dark, we will use the notation N subscript NO or N0 and P subscript N0 to indicate the equilibrium majority and minority carrier concentrations in the dark. And under these conditions, the law of mass action is obviously obeyed because it's in equilibrium. And we get then that NN naught times PN naught is equal to NI squared. <coughs> Now, on the such a semiconductor, which is in equilibrium and in the dark, we're going to shine some light of suitable energy that it can cause the excitation from the, conduction, from the valence band to the conduction band. So H nu is greater than Eg, enough to cause this transition. What happens to the carrier concentrations when this happens? Obviously, now I'm going to change the carrier concentration, and I'm going to generate electron hole pairs because it's similar to the thermal generation. Every time an electron is excited, I create a hole. So I create electron hole pairs. And now there is an excess of electrons in the, uh, in the uh, conduction band and an excess of holes in the conduction band compared with the equilibrium condition. I'm sorry, in the valence band. Holes are in the valence band always. So we get the excess concentrations would be referred to as delta NN and delta PN. These are the excess concentrations created by the illumination with this light. So we can then write that the instantaneous majority carrier concentration after it has been illuminated with suitable light is then going to be what? N, N naught plus delta N, N. And correspondingly, the minority carrier concentration after this process is then P, N naught plus delta P, N. Two things here. Delta NN is equal to delta PN because it's an electron hole pair creation process. And the other thing is that the law of mass action is not obeyed because we are out of equilibrium now. In other words, NN, the instantaneous values, do not equal NI squared. And the rate of change of the majority carrier concentration then, d n n by dt, the rate of change of the majority carrier concentration is simply the rate of change of these excess carriers because as we see in this equation here, this has no time dependence. It's the equilibrium value. It's a temperature dependent, but we're keeping temperature constant. So the time change is taking place with, this, with respect to these two terms. So correspondingly, the rate of change of majority carrier concentration is related to the rate of change of the excess carriers. And similarly, the rate of change of the minority carrier concentration is given by D delta P 
n n I should put by <coughs> d t. All right. Now, what we have to now look at is what has happened to the semiconductor once this kind of a change has occurred? How much of a change has taken place? One of the things we'll do is we'll assume it's a fairly weak illumination, or what might be called a weak injection condition. It's injecting carriers, so weak injection or weak illumination. By that, we mean that the illumination is sufficient to ch cause a 10% change in n n naught. We'll look at a case like that and see what happens in this situation. All right? The illumination is strong enough to have changed n n naught by 10%. Let's take a concrete example. Let's say n n naught is equal to approximately 5 into 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cube. That's the equilibrium value. So delta n n will be? 0.1 of this, 10% changed, or roughly 0.5 into 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cubed, or 5 into 10 to the power 15. One order of magnitude change is taking place. Okay? So in this situation, what do we have then? N, 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 sorry, is equal to N, N naught plus delta N, N, and we get 5.5. Uh, into 10 to the power 16 per centimeter cube, right? Just that's the change that has taken place. Similarly, if we look now for the holes, what is delta P in? Point five, it's the same as delta N N, okay? So it's simply equal to delta N N, and so that is 0.5 into 10 to the power 16. To appreciate what has happened, let us also look at what is the equilibrium value of the whole concentration. This is the excess holes that have been created. To look at the equilibrium concentration, I'll, we'll come back to this number. We know that N N naught times P N naught is N I squared under the equilibrium unilluminated or in the dark condition. I know this number is 5 into 10 to the power 16. Now say this is silicon at room, the room temperature, Ni for silicon, let's say is 1.5, it's roughly something like this, 1 into 10 to the power 10 per centimeter cube, Ni. 1.5 into 10 to the power 10. So I know this number too then, and from that I can calculate that the equilibrium concentration in the dark for the minority carriers by using these two numbers here is roughly 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 per centimeter cube. Do you see the difference? The equilibrium value of the minority carrier concentration was 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 per centimeter cubed the excess hole concentration created by the illumination is 5 into 10 to the power 16. I'm sorry, 5 into 10 to the power 15. 12 orders of magnitude change in the minority carrier concentration by illuminating it. So that's a very drastic change. The electron concentration has changed from 5 into 10 to the power 16 to 5.5, a small change. But the hole concentration or the minority carrier concentration has gone from 4.5 into 10 to the power 3 to 5 into 10 to the power 15 in the carrier concentration. So schematically, if we look at it and we make a plot of the different concentrations, if that is P N naught, that's something like 4.5 into 10 to the power 3. I've got an Ni. This is a log scale, okay, lab carrier concentration, log values. This is Ni, which is something like, what did we say, 10 to the power 10. And then we had... Uh, N, N naught, 5 into 10 to the power 16. That's the situation before we illuminate. After we illuminate, we've now got that P N naught, or P N, the in instantaneous value, has come up here to be now, when you add up P N naught with delta P, it's roughly 
the same as delta p because delta p is 12 orders of magnitude greater. So 0.5 into 10 to the power 16. I've slightly changed my majority carrier concentration. It's now 5.5 into 10 to the power 16. And we have the original values here for Ni and Tn naught. So this is the situation before illumination. After illumination, there's this big jump, 12 orders of magnitude jump. And this significantly then affects the device behavior after we've illuminated it. After I turn off the light, what's going to happen? After I turn off the light, the semiconductor has to go back to equilibrium, all right? And in that case, it has to get back to where, I'm sorry, Pn, the minority carrier concentration, should get back to Pn naught. So I've got to bring it all the way back from 10 to the power 16 back to 10 to the power 3. In other words, I'm going to have to cause recombination to take place, and these delta Pn's that were created are going to recombine with the delta Nn. The excess holes that were created will recombine with the excess electrons. But this process is going to take time. It's not that as soon as I switched off the light, it's come back to equilibrium. Much as when I switched on the light, it took some time for this process to take place. It's time dependent. And accordingly, we will define minority carrier lifetime as the average time that these excess holes remain before they recombine. The average time that the excess holes remain in the valence band before recombination. It's a very significant number. It's got the symbol, in this case, tau h, because you're referring to an n-type semiconductor. So that, that's the average lifetime of the hole before it recombines. 1 by t a tau h, then, is the average probability per unit time. a hole will recombine. We don't call it majority carrier lifetime because even though majority carriers are involved, because once this uh, uh, hole is trapped somewhere in a recombination center, there's plenty of majority carriers. So it is related to how many trapping centers, recombination centers are available for the hole. So I'll leave it at that since we don't have time and I'll take up the idea of uh, lifetime. Uh, next time, a little more in detail. We got maybe a few more topics to cover in this, and then I'll do um, devices, a few devices. Then we look at dielectrics and polymers. Could, could you? Uh, Give me the paper, thank you.